Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie and my major is gynecology. Welcome to my channel, Gynecology with Steph. The topic for today is indications for hysterectomy. Why your doctor may recommend that you get a hysterectomy done? Or as a doctor, what are the indications that your patient would require a hysterectomy? So from A to D, we are going to look at them one after the other. In this video, I shall be explaining each indication in detail. Uterine rupture is the spontaneous tearing of the uterus that may result in a fetus being expelled into the peritoneal cavity. If a woman who has had a prior caesarean delivery wishes to try a vagina delivery, prostaglandins should not be used because they increase the risk of uterine rupture. The symptoms and signs of uterine rupture include fetal bradycardia, variable decelerations, evidence of hypovolemia, loss of fetal station and severe or constant abdominal pain. If the fetus has been expelled from the uterus and is located within the peritoneal cavity, fetal and maternal morbidity and mortality increase significantly. Girls in the uterus may be of accidental or infectious origin. In the latter case, it is caused by the entrance or introduction of gas forming bacilli into the generative tract where the presence of necrotic tissue provides favorable soil. As the infection spreads in the fulminating types, the involved tissue becomes gangrenous and full of gas bubbles. Trinchinography is the method of choice for the diagnosis of gas skin grain of the uterus. The gas bubbles are demonstrable in the range uniform and the extent of the involvement can be accurately determined, making early treatment possible. Guinea pig inoculation with material from anaerobic lactose, agar cultures and smears from the labia, vagina and uterus is another diagnostic procedure. At operation, gas escape when the infected tissue is opened and the uterus appears black, friable and extensively necrotic. Uterine fibers are known cancerous growths of the uterus that often appear during childbearing years, also called leomyomas or myomas. Uterine fibers aren't associated with an increased risk of uterine cancer and almost never develop into cancer. In women who have symptoms, the most common signs and symptoms of uterine fibers include heavy menstrual bleeding, menstrual periods lasting more than a week, pelvic pressure or pain, frequent urination, difficulty emptying the bladder, constipation, backache or leg pains. It is important to note that fibroids can cause anemia. Anemia is a condition that happens when your body does not have enough healthy red blood cells to carry oxygen to your organs. It can make you feel tired and weak. Some women may develop intense cravings for ice and starch. This is called pica and is associated with anemia. Fibroids can make your periods heavy or even make you bleed between periods. Some treatments like oral ion pills or if you are significantly anemic, an ion infusion can improve your anemia. There are four specific locations where you can have uterine fibroids. We have the submucosa fibroids. In this case, the fibroids are growing inside the uterine space where a baby grows during pregnancy. Think of the growths as tending down into the empty space in the middle of the uterus. We have the intramural fibroids which are embedded into the wall of the uterus itself. Picture the sides of the uterus like walls of a house. These fibroids are growing inside this muscular wall. We have the subserosal fibroids located on the outside of the uterus. These fibroids are connected closely to the outside wall of the uterus. And lastly, pedunculated fibroids, the least common type. These fibroids are also located on the outside of the uterus. However, pedunculated fibroids are connected to the uterus with a thin stem. They are often described as mushroom-like because they have a stalk and then a much wider top. If you are not planning future pregnancies, there are additional surgical options your healthcare provider may recommend. These options are not recommended if pregnancy is desired and there are surgical approaches that remove the uterus. These surgeries can be very effective but they typically prevent future pregnancies. Surgeries to remove fibroids can include hysterectomy. During this surgery, your uterus is removed. A hysterectomy is the only way to cure fibroids in extreme cases. By removing your uterus completely, the fibroids cannot come back and your symptoms should go away. If your uterus alone is removed, the ovaries are left in place and you will not go into menopause after a hysterectomy. This procedure might be recommended if you are experiencing very heavy bleeding from your fibroids or if you have large fibroids. When recommended, the most minimally invasive procedure to perform hysteroscopy is advisable. Minimally invasive procedures include vaginal, laparoscopic or robotic approaches. Uterine fibroid embolization. This procedure is performed by an interventional radiologist who works with your gynecologist. 
Cervical polyps are usually small, teardrop shaped projections that grow from the surface of the surface or are more commonly in the endocervical canal. The endocervical canal is the inside of the cervix that leads to the uterus. It is lined with glandular cells that are typical of mucous membranes. If you are diagnosed with a cervical polyp because you are having pain, it is most likely a large endometrial polyp or even a prolapsed pedunculated fibroid. In approximately 27% of women with cervical polyps, there are also associated endometrial polyps. The two types of cervical polyps are the endocervical polyp and the ectocervical polyp. Endocervical polyp grows from the glands inside the cervical canal. This is the most common form of cervical polyp and happens most often in women who have not experienced menopause. Ectocervical polyp is the type of polyp that grows from the cells of the outer surface layer of the surface. They are more common in women who have experienced menopause. Ovarian cancer is a group of cells that forms in the ovaries. The cells multiply quickly and can invade and destroy healthy body tissue. The female reproductive system has two ovaries, one on each side of the uterus. The ovaries each is about the size of an almond and produce eggs as well as the hormones estrogen and progesterone. There are three types of ovarian cancer, epithelial ovarian cancer, stroma cancer and germ cell cancer. Epithelial ovarian cancer is a tumor that starts on the outside of the ovary. The majority of cancer causing ovarian tumors are epithelial. Stroma cancer starts from ovarian cells that make hormones. They make up about 1% of ovarian cancer. Germ cell cancer starts in the egg cells. These tumors are very rare, making up less than 2% of ovarian cancers. They occur in younger women and girls. Cervical carcinoma is a cancer arising from either the esocervical squamous epithelium or the endocervical glandular epithelium. Various strains of human papillomavirus, a sexually transmitted infection, play a role in causing most cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is divided into two main types, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the type of cervical cancer that begins in the thin flat cells lining the outer parts of the cervix which projects into the vagina. Most cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinomas. Adenocarcinoma is a type of cervical cancer that begins in the column shaped glandular cells that line the cervical canal. Sometimes both types of cells are involved in cervical cancer. Very rarely cancer occurs in other cells in the cervix. Here we can see the normal cervix, early stage, late stage and stage 2b of cervical cancer. Endometrial carcinoma is a cancer that begins in the lining of the uterus. This causes vaginal bleeding after menopause or frequent bleeding between menstrual cycles. Endometrial cancer starts when the cells in the endometrium starts to grow out of control. Cells in nearly any parts of the body can become cancer and can spread to other parts of the body. True pelvic examination, pap smear, Endometrial biopsy, dilation and curettage, transvaginal ultrasound, endometrial cancer can be diagnosed. Surgical treatment include hysterectomy, salpingo or ovarectomy, pelvic lymph node dissection, laparoscopic lymph node sampling. Therapeutic treatment include radiation therapy, chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Chronic pelvic pain, while a relatively less common reason for a hysterectomy, accounts for roughly 10% of all gynecological visits. Various gynecologic conditions affecting the female reproductive organs can cause chronic pelvic pain. Surgical treatment options may be appropriate in cases of chronic pelvic pain that involve a known underlying condition. Hysterectomy surgery should be carefully considered in comparison to other available alternatives and options. A complete hysterectomy, also referred to as a total hysterectomy, is a medical procedure during which a woman's cervix and uterus are removed. The surgeon might also take out a woman's ovaries and fallopian tubes in some cases. A complete hysterectomy is different from a partial or subtotal hysterectomy, which is when the surgeon removes only the top portion of the uterus but does not remove the cervix. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.